Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hello, my name is Tim Outy. I'm the president of the MIT Alumni Golfers Association. On behalf of myself and my fellow board members, I'd like to welcome you to this presentation of the art and science of greenskeeping. Uh, we are honored to have as our guest speaker, Bob Renham. Bob is a nationally recognized golf course superintendent, spending a large portion of his career attending to two top 100 courses and is one of only 97 Raiders for Golf Magazine along with, may I say, uh, our esteemed board, fellow board member, Paul Rodowski. Um, so all of us uh, in our uh, playing time have had wow moments where we just say, this course looks absolutely amazing. Uh, and Bob is here to explain what it takes to make those moments happen. Uh, during the presentation, please feel free to submit questions uh, you have via the Q&A function. And after the presentation, my board colleague, Mark Gatag, will moderate a Q&A. So with that, I will turn it over to Bob. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really excited. Um, just to start off with, before I get into the science of anything, is I was going to just tell you a little bit about myself and how I got into the business. Um, so when I was in high school, my, the, my wife that you just saw before, we've been married 44, year, uh, 44 years. She, we're dating, we're in 10th grade. And she says to me, uh, she goes to her father, she goes, daddy, would you give my boyfriend a job? And uh, he was a greenkeeper at a golf course on Long Island called Rockville Links. So he said, yeah, I'll pick him up and take him to work with me. So the first day I go to work, I'm a young kid. He picks me up at my house. He takes me to the golf course. And, you know, after my first day of work, Allison and I used to ride our bicycles. This is you know, way, way back in 70, 70, ride our bicycles and go to um, the, the local train station to meet after whatever school. And so we, pull up and she's all nervous. And she says to me, uh, she goes, how was your first day? And I said, well, my first day was great. I will never do another thing again in my life. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, this is it. This is my profession. I fell in love with the golf course that day. I fell in love and people asked me, what was the first impression? My first impression was the machinery. It was so neat to see all the different machinery, to have your own maintenance building, to work on things. All your tools you had to do, grinding machines adjusting mowers I fell in love with it and I said I never have to look again and obviously um, 44 years as a superintendent I kind of held true to my word so that was kind of like how I started in the business very excited about that went through schooling went through assistance worked for different superintendents and I got an opportunity at 22 years old to interview for Garden City Golf Club which uh, at 22 it was a top 50 club, top 100 club back then. Now it's a top 50 club. I was like, figured I had no chance to get it, but they, they invited me to, uh, to um, interview. And I, I walked the golf course and I knew everything about it. And I had notes and I had everything I needed. And I went for the first interview thinking it was just going to be some a learning experience. And they called me up and they said, we want to bring you back for a second interview. So I said, okay, went back for a second interview. We're only back for a third interview. And they said, listen, we're going to, offer you the job for one year, one year only. If, if it doesn't work out, we love your enthusiasm. We love how excited you are about the golf course. You've done more research on the golf course than any other candidate. Um, but if it doesn't work out because you're too young, we get it. We wash our hands. I said, got it. Well, the first year, I think I killed every play of grass I could find. I did an awful job. I did give them good greens, but the rest of the golf course was terrible. At the end of the year, they brought me into the board and they said, listen, we love your enthusiasm, love your hard work. We're going to give you another, we're going to let you keep going. And then I was there for 13 years and it was a great experience working there at that club. Right now it is for Golf Magazine, the top 50 in the world. So it was a hard place to leave. So that was, um, that was uh, pretty much it. Uh, and that was pretty much, you know, my thing there. And then a quick little story about a couple quick little stories about Garden City Golf Club before we get into science and everything is when um, I was at Garden City Golf Club, my first years was obviously we all as golfers, we all want firm, fast conditions. And that's just fast on the greens, because if you have fast greens and you don't have firm conditions to play into fast or firm greens, it makes no sense. So it's on a wet fairway. You're not getting ball roll. You can't hit the ball. You can't hit a nice you're going to hit a flyer lie off of it. So I worked really hard on the playing conditions of tees, fairways, and greens. And once I felt like I got them on about three or four years in, I felt, okay, I got it pretty good. The golf course going in the right direction. I understand the watering. I got the place going. 
during the winter, I went up to the clubhouse. And if anybody's, I'm sure you guys have played Garden City Golf Club. It's this old great clubhouse. And doing it, I went upstairs in the attic. I found all these old pictures. And I was so excited. And I, I brought them back to my office. And I said, I got to I gotta do some work out here. So I went out to the second hole in the winter. And I dug all new bunkers. And I redesigned the whole perimeter of the hole. And then I went to number 11. And I built a big waste bunker in front of it. And I was so excited. And, wait till somebody to see it in the spring. Never told anybody I was doing it. That's how young I was. I didn't even think like that. And then I go in and I, I do it and I don't hear anything in the spring. And all of a sudden I get a phone call. Would you, Bob, would you like to come up to the board meeting today? We have to talk to you. I'm like, wow. And I walk in and they say, Bob, who gave you permission to do those two holes? I said, well, nobody really. I just kind of like got excited about it and I did it. And I could see I was in trouble with the board. And all of a sudden they said, listen, and they threw a magazine across to me and it was the Met Golfer. And in the cover of the Met Golfer, it said Garden City Golf Club getting better every year. And the only two pitches they showed was number two and number 11. So they said to me, you know, we get it. We get that you understand you love architecture and we get we need to be work, but you can't do it on your own. So you're going to have to interview some architects to work on the golf course. So I said, okay. So we made a list of um, uh, architects. And I had to interview them. So I'd play golf with them, go out there, spend a day with them, see what they want. I went through a series of them. I was having no luck. Everybody just didn't get Garden City. If you knew Garden City, it's a unique place. You really, really have to understand that it's a subtle place. It's an interesting place. And you don't want to make it anything else than it is. So I went through this and we finally got to PB Dye. And this is my PB Dye story. So PB Dye and I and my green chairman, Tom Poole, we go out and we play golf. And PB Dye is playing and he's yapping, he's looking all around. And I'm like, okay. And we get to the eighth hole, which the eighth hole is a wonderful par four, valley in the front, great architecture. He doesn't say anything, get on the ninth tee. And he says to me, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make this hole so, I'm gonna make number eight so good, you're not gonna believe it. I said, what are you gonna do to it? And he goes, I'm gonna make it so hard. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And then when you get on the ninth tee, you're going to be so overwhelmed by that last. Bob, Bob, your audio, I think is cut out. Up to the 13th tee. And he says, uh, you don't like me too much, do you? And I said, nah, there's really nothing I like about you at all. And so he doesn't say another word. We play in my poor chairman is very awkward. He's like, oh, Bobby, what are you saying? We sit down and he says, I didn't get this job, did I? I said, I'm not giving you this job. He goes, but I got a guy for you, Bob. I said, really? He goes, I got a young guy, worked for my dad, just came out of Scott, back from Scotland studying, built a golf course called Heathland, um, building a golf course, Heathland and Myrtle Beach. I think you two would get along really good. And who it was? It was Tom Doak. This was Tom in his early, early career. So Tom came in. We, we played golf together. He was fantastic. I mean, the genius of Tom Doak was phenomenal. Just to get inside his head, listening to what he saw at Garden City Golf Club. He saw the subtleties of the golf course. And we walked in. And as soon as I got off the 18th green, I turned to my chairman. I said, this is it. You don't have to look any further. This man is a genius. He's going to go far in his career. And, um, and we just got along great. So we started doing work together at Garden City Golf Club. And my favorite nights were going into my office at night. And Tom and I just chat about architecture and talk about what he saw in his mind about it and what I saw. And just, like, yeah, just having great conversations. And then he, at the time, Gil Hans worked under him. So there you had Tom Doak and Gil Hans working on Garden City Golf Club, young in their career. And we both know where Gil is right now. And we know how great Tom is right now. So as we, as, um, we moved on, and then uh, eventually I said, I, I, I said to myself, I said to Allison, I want to get to the next, I want to get to the highest level of my profession I can get to. So that would have been trying to move up to like maybe a wing foot or a Baltus roll. I, I didn't really know where I wanted to go, but I knew I wanted something big. And Go Atlanta Golf Club was being going to be built. And I said, if I get construction, get construction under me, I can take that construction and I can go anywhere. 
because now I'll have Garden City Golf Club, 13 years. Well, back then it was like, 11, yeah, 13 years. And, and go someplace like Atlantic for three or four years, and then we'll reach out to something else. So we had a plan. So we get there, and obviously, like all good plans, that didn't work out because I spent 30 years at Garden's Atlantic Golf Club, which was great. But getting real quick back to a Tom Doak thing. So now my assistant took over Garden City, and a confidential guide came out from Tom Doak about golf courses. So he calls me up, Ed, and says, hey, Bob, did you see this new book Tom did? I said, no. Nah. He goes, oh, he goes, Atlantic is in it. I said, oh, what do he say? And he said, Atlantic, a little artificial. The mounding was there. It was a little rowdy. He was still, like beating it up. And I said, you know what? I'm so tired of Tom Doak. He's so opinionated. And he goes, yeah, but he did say one thing. He said, Bob Rainham is the superintendent there. And he was the best superintendent I ever worked with. I said, that man is a genius and he's going to go far. So that was my Tom Doak thing. So moving on from there, let me just catch up on my notes. Um, so, that, so then let's just keep moving on. I'm sorry about this. Um, and then um, as I moved on, I, uh, I realized, you know, after 30 years, I wanted to retire. And I didn't know what I was going to do. But I knew it was time to move on from Garden City, I, from Atlantic. Think, keep thinking Garden City because I loved it so much, which I still do. And I was, so I'm getting ready to retire. I went to the club. I said, listen, I'm going, I think it's my last year coming up. You want to hire somebody to work with me my last year, I move on. And then Rand Morissette, which we all know, approached me and said, listen, I'm taking over Golf Magazine's top 100 world and the United States. I'd like you to come on board as a panelist. And I said, listen, I don't want any part of that. I see this golf digest thing. There's 1700 Raiders. They all just want to play golf. I'm into the golf course architecture. I am not into just being another guy getting free golf. I can get that being a golf course superintendent. So he goes, no, no, it's nothing like that, Bob. We're going to have 60, 65 people. We're all going to love golf. We're all going to be able to work together. And we're all really going to put together a real list. So I said, well, this is just right up my alley. I said, 44 years as a golf course superintendent, loving golf course architecture, being around Shinnecock National, Maidstone, you know, uh, Friars Head, which is fantastic. Being all that, I'm like, this is, this is perfect for me. So, but I also knew at that point that if I didn't keep myself active, that I mean, so I started, which we have now, RNA, uh, RNA Consulting, and I do golf course consulting, and I, do, um, and I do consulting on large estates just to keep my mind built, going quick. So between the GOP and that has worked out good. Um, and, and that's pretty much where we're going. So the career was very young at 22 years old at Garden City Golf Club, fantastic. And I gotta say one thing, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people have, Al, did I lose this? Okay. A lot, oh, a lot of people have said to me uh, over the years, um, a lot of people have said to me over the years, how did you learn? How did you come up with, you know, who'd you work for? That was so good. That taught you all these ideas. I said, what it was, was the members of Garden City Golf Club. The members of Garden City Golf Club, there was a hundred members, 10 or less handicapped. Gil McNally was the golf pro and Tommy Poole was the green chairman. And they, I was so young that I didn't really understand too much so they used to tell me all the time, this is the way a golf course should play, firm. You know, we have to, we want, we want a flyer lie in the rough, but we want a firm, be able to spin the ball into a firm green. And that's, so working at the men's club really honed my career to where I am, was as a golf course superintendent, realizing playing conditions were more important than an aesthetic look. I've always been accused, especially at Car Atlantic, is I always felt that, 10 or 20% of my golf course wasn't brown, I was overwatering it. I always felt like playing was more important than visual. And if I had it playing right, people would forget about the visual part of it. And I think they did. And, and now, so I can, so basically that's where I all came from. That's how I got to that point. That was where my career path was. Um, and then now I go into like, okay, now that I, um, Next slide would be good. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting this whole thing. I'm not telling you what I'm doing all the time. So then what happened is now I, 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 I I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. So now I go, go out into the world as a consultant. And it's fun because now I'm starting to see, which is what you really want to know about, the difference between 
the younger superintendent and the older superintendent. So let's say technology has come a long way. When I first became a superintendent, all I needed was a pair of sunglasses, a knife and a pro. That's all I had. My first job at Garden City, I was me, a foreman, six guys, no mechanic, no, we had to do everything ourselves. When I left Garden City, when I left um, Atlantic, I had three assistants, a mechanic, an assistant mechanic. I had a state-of-the-art irrigation system, state-of-the-art pump house, every piece of equipment you could have. But I still always used my probe, my knife, and, and, uh, and my sunglasses. You can go to the next slide. Um, and uh, I've always been, you know, and I've always been accused of that I could feel a golf course on my feet. So, for example, when I was, um, if I'd get up and go on the first, I walked the golf course every day. You have to feel your golf course from your feet. And I'd walk on the first tee, and I'd call one of my assistants. Did anybody put any extra water on this golf course today? I can feel it underneath my foot. And they'd say, "Well, we got a little worried that we jumped it up a little bit," and. And, uh, you know, and I said, no, you can't. we got to stay the course. we got to keep it firm. we got to keep it plain. We can't just think about getting through the day. So we, we ended up, so, uh, hold, and then, um, it's, it's not working. Next slide. You can help. Okay. Uh, uh, next slide. Next slide. Let me just move you. So go, I'm sorry, I'm a little thing. I don't usually do this. I do this in front of just a live group, not, not all this. So sorry about that. Um, so in saying that, that uh, I always felt that a good, you know, a, a good, your feet are your number one thing. And if I get into, and I always used to teach my guys, we got to do it that way. So let's go more into what I see now. Talk about the science. We'll talk about the art. And I'm, I'm a superintendent that does the art more than the science, but all of us have to start off with a soil test. So you have to get a foundation to build off of. So a soil test, which as you see up here right now, is a basic soil test on your golf course. This shows the superintendent what's in the ground for him to work at. Me, I look at the organic matter. So for example, when I download this, and I get these soil tests at a golf course or my own golf course, or even actually where I'm the green chairman here, I look at the organic matter. And looking at the organic matter, I say, God, if it's over 2%, it tells me right away the, fertilizer, the, the superintendent's fertilizing too much, watering too much, he's mismanaging it. You're never going to get good playing conditions with that. So the first thing we have to do then is you have to aerify. The aerifier is the superintendent's best friend. So now he goes in, he aerifies, we have to reduce that. We adjust everything else. We adjust the nitrogen levels. We adjust the organic matter. We adjust the pH, as you can see going down here. And as we go through all those things and we get the soil test right, now we've got the foundation done. We know that. Now we go, next slide, I think. And now we have to go through what he does as a superintendent. The days of a granular fertilizer are over. They're done. Fertilizer is the, the catalyst, you could say, for your whole golf course. If you over fertilize your golf course, it becomes slow. It becomes thatchy. All the bad things happen. The leaf blade gets thick. All the things you do starts with that fertilizer program. So when I first became a superintendent, or even when I was a young assistant, we, we granular fed twice a year. That was the normal we put it out there two times, hit it. Okay, great. Sprayed the fairways once in a while. That was great. Then as the years went on, all granulars went out and it was all liquid fertilizer through high-tech sprayers. So we would have precise spraying at a gallon or two gallons per thousand square feet. We would spray our golf courses with liquid fertilizer and very, very low amounts. I've had it down as far as a, at the end of the year, depending on the rainfall, I've had it down as low as a pound of nitrogen through your golf course over the whole season and produce great green speed, great playing conditions and all that. So when we start off, we do with a, the fertilizers, your number one. Next slide. Then obviously, once you get your fertilizers correct, you have to look at your irrigation systems. 
we are very fortunate nowadays. We went from a quick coupler system where we used to put the quick coupler system in and a hand hose and whatever, and just water basic stuff. And what you tend to do was overwater golf courses. So it's always funny when I, you know, you hear all everybody who overwaters, everything was always soft and greens, greens were never really that fast. You always hear these just to re- you always hear these stories like, oh, I remember 40 years ago, the greens were so fast, it was unbelievable. When I took Garden City Golf Club over in 78, I had my green speed the first year or two was nine feet. And they were considered the fastest greens on Long Island. When I left Atlantic, my average day, day in and day in green speed was 12 feet. And they were considered average green speeds. So you could just see in my 44 years from nine feet being super fast to, to um, 12 feet being, well, everybody else is 12 feet too. Can you get them any faster? It's funny, but getting back to the irrigation system. So nowadays, the technology of the irrigation system is phenomenal. When I had an Atlantic, I had 1,500 heads, individually head controlled, everyone different. I ran it off my iPad or my, or my phone. I could adjust every head every day. And then that all computed back to a weather station. And I ran two weather stations on my golf course that would dictate ET to me, next slide, please, would dictate, um, pretty good, I got it right on the button that time, um, dictate two slides and two things for my ET, and then I would get that information, and then my job was to see how much of that I wanted. I found out through my years of irrigating the golf course that, next slide, uh, irrigating the golf course, I, um, I found that 40% of it would give me just what I wanted. A little brown, the edges were browning out, place played firm, 40% work. Where I go, most superintendents who do use this technology, which is not as much as you think it would be, they're kind of running about 50%. For example, the, the superintendent took over from me, who was excellent. He bumped it up to 50% because he didn't want to see as much brownish that I used to give. And and then, um, and then uh, so as much brown that I used to give. So he... You know, and it's still the people love it. It's great. I might have went a little bit too firm at times or too dry at times, but that's what I did. The other thing that we use now, we have a great irrigation system. The head spacings are perfect. We water where we want to water. We do all we want to do. We have a moisture meter, which you see up here. And the moisture meter tells us where we want our green firmness to be. And everybody's greens and everybody's golf course is different. So if you go there, you have to decide what's best for your golf course. And it's through interacting with the members to see when they feel like it's firm enough to where you feel it's good to where the green speed works. At Atlantic, we used to run 12%. There are some places that run 9% on the dry side. There are some places that run 15 to 20 and some places that run 20. The superintendent has to determine. But there's another tool that, that I never had back in the 80s that now in the 90s and 2000 I I had so I could tell I go on a green I could tell exactly I could unify that green perfectly with this moisture meter which you guys would like and then if everything comes full circle then I would take a hose so now you go from beginning where we used to use hoses and quick couplers to we still go back to hoses because now you take your hose with all that technology and then you go around that green and you even every little spot of that green out. So the green is 100% uniform moisture levels. And that's where that goes. Next slide. And then again, so we're setting that up. Now you can see the ET is the tool that superintendents use with their weather station to help give them how much water each day we're losing. And that's a great tool. And I'm amazed, and I should say this, and I hate to throw people under the bus because I do do a lot of traveling. Um, I'm amazed at superintendent. I go to a superintendent. I said, do you have a weather station? Yes, I do. Do you have a good irrigation system? Yeah, let's go run the irrigation system. So we run the irrigation system. It's not great. They think it's good, but it's things that could be improved. I say, okay, how do you water the place? Well, I know my golf course. So I water it myself. I said, don't you use ET? Oh, no, I wouldn't use ET. I said, why wouldn't you use all this information you have? You have a state of an art irrigation system. You have this tool that you can have to help you determine exactly. And they would say, well, no, I know my golf course. That's the favorite line that I always hear. I know my golf course better than anybody. I always say, do me a favor. 
give me two weeks my way. And then you tell me if it's not better. Because I, and I'll get back to the ET. When I was at Garden City Golf Club, there was no such thing of that. So to me, when I wore irrigated, I would be like, oh, it's really dry today. I'm going to water six minutes. Oh, it's really humid today. I mean, I mean, it's really humid today. I'm going to water six minutes. Oh, it's really dry today. The minute he dropped, I'm going to go to 10 minutes. So my span was between six and 10 minutes. That's how I irrigated. When I went to Atlantic and got a weather station, I was amazed that ET would tell me sometimes you could water the whole golf course with high humidity at two to three minutes. And when that humidity dropped and the temperature, you know, and the wind was blowing, I watered up to 20 to 25 minutes and had the same playing surface. So I always try to explain what you're missing is you were just small, but when you, you, you go, if you really look at what the ET and the weather station tells you, there's a huge difference that you're missing. So what superintendents tend to do is when it gets humid, they're overwatering. And when it gets dry and windy and low humidity, they're underwatering. This takes it all out. So I'm always amazed and it takes me time. And I'll tell you, I would have to say 20% of the golf courses use this technology now. I was just at Wingfoot the other day. I'm doing a, a rating of it on the East, which I loved. And uh, I, Steve's one of the best superintendents in the world. And I say, you using your weather station? Now I know my golf course. I said, Steve, I know you know your golf course, but this is just one more tool you're not even utilizing. Don't tell me, I know my golf course. So that's just about where that technology comes. Next slide, please. And really when you think about it, you know, I always say, the things that make a superintendent good are pretty easy. First of all, we have to know how to deal with a guy making $6 an hour to a, a, the, the pro shop staff, the clubhouse staff that are in middle of wages to a billionaire, all in the course of a day. So I have to set my guys up. I have to do this. So I need to do that. I also need super sharp mowers. You know, if you have a sharp mower, you take out 50% of your problems. You have a dull mower, you have a lot of problems. You also have to know all those, you know, the fertilizers. You have to know all your chemicals. You have to know your spray program. You have to set everything up and get it right. You have to know all your diseases. But the number one thing that we do as golf course superintendents, or I like to say greenkeeper, is we have to irrigate. And, you know, I can get there and I am, I'm at my mowers on shop. I go into the mechanic. I yell at him for a while. He gets a little bit better. My crew in the morning, I know how to do that. I get to learn them. I get to train them. The members, I know which one are going to complain a lot, which one isn't. But the only decision that I have to make every single day that nobody can help me with is irrigate my golf course. It's the only decision almost every day that you as playing a golf course notices. So if I'm over irrigating, you notice it because your ball doesn't roll as far. So if your ball's not rolling as far, it's like, what the hell's going on? It's beautiful weather and I've just lost 10 yards. Or if you under irrigate, you start to lose turf. So we as superintendents take all this technology that we are now getting, we have weather stations, moisture meters, probes, our feet, all this information that we have and you walk your golf course every day. And then at the end of the day, you before you set your irrigation up through the um, weather station, you go out on your golf course again at six o'clock, seven o'clock at night. And at that, you take all this information every single day, seven days a week, you put it together in your head and you go in your office and you say, okay, this is how I'm going to irrigate to give the members the best conditions they can get the next day and, and, um, and to do all that. So with, if we're doing our fertilizer right, we're irrigating right, we're top dressing right, we're grooming when we have to do, we take all the tools that we now have and put it. Now, in saying, we have a hell of a lot of tools, as you can hear. But if you don't know how to use those tools, it all goes to a waste. So that's why wherever I go, I really preach to every superintendent, the fertilizing, the watering, take your extra time, run your irrigation system. If you don't have a weather station, get a weather station. I'm just doing a project now at North Park Country Club. We're doing a bunker project, old Donald Ross, new superintendent. I go into the first meeting. You got a moisture meter? No, get him a moisture meter. You got a, you got a weather station? No. I said, you got a brand new irrigation system. You know the one? Get them a weather station. 
And then we put those tools together. And I he said to me, this is great. So now I'm, I'm looking at the greens with the moisture meter. I got a weather station giving me information and I'm going around the golf course. And remember the best superintendents out there are the ones that I call it first in last out. One of the reasons I retired was it's hard to go to work at 4.30 in the morning every day and come home seven o'clock at night every day. And if you don't do that, you can never, that golf course changes so quickly that if you don't do that, if you're not on top of it, if you don't put all the time in and your whole self into it, it will never be to where the level you want it. So next slide. Okay, so that's pretty much where I go with what I'm trying to convey out there now or the way I lived, me being a superintendent. We, I put everything into it every single day. Um, I put everything into my crew, into my members. I did everything I thought was right. Now, I'm sure if we had another superintendent or greenkeeper out here today, he might be saying, he might be saying, well, I don't believe in that. I'll do, I like to do this. And that's pretty much it. I see the younger superintendents are more into the technology and not the art. And the older guys, which there are very few left, are more into the art. I'll give you an example of like a, a superintendent um, I won't say their names, but I have two great clubs on the East End. And I've looked at them for a long time. And one is all about art and one's all about science. And I'll guarantee you day to day, the one, if I told you the names, you would say, oh, that one's a lot better than the other one. The superintendent that has it as art does better than the superintendent. Now, if you could take art and science and put them together, good, but you can't leave one of them out. You might be able to leave some of the science, but you can't leave any of the art. So in saying that, I'm just going to move on to the investment that the USGA has done. As you can see on this slide, they put $18 million in grants and university development for new grasses. Now, new grasses are interesting to me. Now, I travel all over. So I was just in, two weeks ago, I was in Tennessee at Macklemore. Now, Tennessee, no, Georgia, Georgia. He's right on the board of Tennessee, Georgia. So in, in that, I see... I'm up there and got beautiful bent grass greens in an environment that's pretty hostile for growing bent grass. One or two fans, not a lot of fans, no sub airs, no nothing, nothing, just pure push up green. Really good. It was, uh, it was, um, it was uh, a grass from Auburn, uh, Auburn University called Victory. Never heard of it. And I'm looking at this point. And I guess when I bring it up is there, th these, these um, universities, are developing better and better and better grasses all the time. Less pesticide, water, I mean, irrigating, less water to run them, less maintenance to get them to where you want them. So the universities are just doing a fantastic job in developing. And I always say this, I'm down here in South Carolina. I also still up in Southampton. I'm still a member of, of Atlantic gave me a membership. And I'm also a member of Southampton Golf Club. If anybody ever played that, it's a fabulous Seth Rayner golf course. So I'm still up there, but down here, they're Bermuda Greens champion. And I always say within five to 10 years, you're going to get rid of this champion and you're going to go back to bank grass. Because as they develop this bent grass better and better and get through these summers here in humidity, it's a better playing surface. And all the maintenance you have to do on this Bermuda grass with verticutting, top dressing, you got all the stuff, the bent grass is going to come back. Next slide. So, uh, so let's go into, let's going to go. So that's the USGA developing grasses. I'm a big fan of fine fescues, as we all love. Um, bent grass fairways are great, and the new technology is good. I'm not a big gooey bluegrass guy. I love natural grasslands, and we could talk about natural grasslands forever. But let's go into um, green construction. So over the years, as you could see, the greens um, used to be push-up greens. So if we all go to Scotland and Ireland, which we all do, I hope, they're all just natural sandy areas. And the architects, they were very fortunate to have a sandy soil that they could push dirt around and shape and do their artwork. You know, obviously on top, drainage was an issue. So the greens might have a little bit more slope. Green speeds were not like they were. So the architects might put a little bit more movement in them um, right now. And, uh, and that's all sandy soil. They had the great sites. Here, they bring this technology, they come over with their great designs like Donald Ross and, their, uh, and they don't have the same environment. I mean, Shinnecock is great. National great soil. But then you look at anything in Jersey, 
is heavy clay. So they're building these greens off of a heavy soil and they're failing over the years because all of a sudden the green speeds went from seven feet to 12 feet, which I have a real, I don't understand why people do that. I mean, I think just to regress a little is I really am a firm believer that the biggest obligation the superintendent has is to blend his design with his conditions. So for example, when someone says, you know, I played a golf course in Ohio a month ago, whatever, the Donald Ross greens was 12 feet, perfect, firm, great. Couldn't put a green. The back to front slope was so, in, so intense. There were three pin placements on the whole green. So I don't believe that the superintendent is blending his maintenance with that architecture. Just like when you look at some great old golf courses that have big wide fairways and great angles to go into. And they're, and, and they're not playing that way because they're not firm or there's too many trees on the golf course. I was in Tennessee doing one on the honors course. And thank God Gil Hans is coming in to redo it. But there's trees all over the honors course. Now I know it's a Pete Dye golf course, so you can get away with that, but you're still losing you know, shot value when you take put a tree somewhere where it shouldn't be. So getting, so that's, I went off to the deep end a little bit on that one, I apologize. So we get back to USGA Green. So then they came in, the USGA says, okay, we're gonna build a green that doesn't fail. We can put it anywhere. We can go in any place we can put it in. So they make these USGA greens. I personally, not a big fan for this reason only. A lot of times it's hard to build a USGA green and blend the surrounds with that USGA green because now you put in an artificial thing in there. It's not like just letting the architect just shape. I remember when Friar's head was being built and I'd go over there all the time to watch Bill Core work and Dave Axland and they just dumped sand. They just dumped sand on everything and shaped everything. And it was like phenomenal. They didn't worry about that. And I looked at where other places are USJ Green's heart. Next slide. Now, the new thing now is that I see, and I saw it at Southern Hills, and I saw it at uh, Wingfoot, saw it at Marion, and at Baltusrol, is the new sub air systems. So now they're taking this to the superintendent and saying, okay, now we're going to build you a USGA green. We're going to put a drainage system that will suck air out like Augusta and blow air in and do all this great technology that, next slide, all this great technology you see in front of us, all this next technology that when it, like the masses, when it was muddy, you sucked out the water. You can throw cool air in. Uh, in Southern Hills, they have a cooling system that actually when Russ gets, Russ Meyer, the super, when it gets hot, he just shoots cool air in. Now that's way over my head being you know, an older superintendent, but that's where the technology is going now. So the new, not only USGA Green, they're doing USGA Greens with a whole sub air and a whole system under the ground for cooling. Um, it, you, somebody's going to probably ask me a question. Does it work? You'd have to ask the superintendents, but I haven't seen it work tremendously. I think they get a percentage that works, but I don't think it's, it does exactly what they do. When I, before I left Atlantic, I built a chipping area and I put a sub air system under it just to see, and I never saw more than 20% or 25% of something special. So you know, to me, if you, you know, if you forget your green running right and you, you do everything right on that green, you put internal drainage, you can produce the same thing. But in saying that, a lot of superintendents will argue that point. Next slide. As you can see, the piping system there, um, you know, they put this thing. There's another thing to think about. I don't know. I'd be a little nervous if I was a golf course superintendent and I had all this piping and all this blowing and all this junk in my every one of my greens and something happened. So, for example, if you got if you got a cooling system like Southern Hills and you're bringing um, cool water in to cool the system, you are throwing water underneath your green now and it could anything could happen. Next slide. And as now you can see just about golf, I'm real quick to go through this because I know I'm running late, is look at what happened this with, with everything going on in this world, golf has exploded. You can read what it is up in here, the, the more people that are playing. And what I see wherever I travel is the...
2020. Think about that. When I became a superintendent in 78, it was, when I became a superintendent in 78, we couldn't find members at Garden City Golf Club. You were getting a membership with no initiation, just pay the dues we wanted you. And now look at it. Next slide. So this basically is just saying it's important for the superintendent to see the golf course from the golfer's perspective. And you know what's interesting? One of the things I thought I, uh, because I was a successful superintendent, I also was a member of another club, Southampton. So when I go play there, I would go there, play there with the green chairman or the president of the club, and I could see the comments they made. And I realized it wasn't just about what I see, it's about playing it. I also say a golf course superintendent has to play golf. He has to see The archi an architect or green champ. I like to play with different levels of golf from a two handicap to a 20 handicap. And when I rate that golf course, I can see that. One of the things I love about, I go to the next slide. That's that. One of the things I love about this, about me rating a golf course, and I'll explain it real quick before I end. When I go rate a golf course from Golf Magazine, I, I walk off with a couple of things. If I walk off that 18th green, and I say, I want to go back to the first tee and play this again. That's big for me. If I walk off that 18th green and I remember the golf holes, that's big for me. I want to remember golf holes. I want to enjoy the golf course. As a golf course superintendent, I love greens that have angles and I love greens that have contours because contours make a superintendent. Now I say contours, but if I had a green that was over contoured and I had three pin placements, that's not good. I want a variety of pin placements. I want a big enough green that I can, I can make the golf course interesting every day. For example, three-day member guests, three different ways for that to play. So variety in golf, memorabilia in golf, and wanting fun in golf. I am not a fan, and I tell this to Randall, I am not a fan of 7,500-yard golf course that beats you up, high rough, you know, all the things that beat you up. And people say, oh, that's great. They, you know, they, uh, I just, I just shot 85 and it was like Oakmont. I just played Oakmont and, oh my God, it beat me up. I I was harried and then you see people rate it so high. So that's just the way I look. So I'm going to call it there now because then Allison's looking at me like I, I've been talking too much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. That was, that was really interesting. Um, for, for those of you out there, I'm Mark Duttag. I'm on the uh, MIT Alumni Golf Board and I'm here to facilitate some of the questions we had coming in. It looks like we got two so far, but feel free at the bottom of the Zoom window, there should be a the Q and A option. You can go feel free to, to ask any questions you want there. Uh, and I'll just kick off with the, with the first one from Tom Brown. He had a question about ball marks on greens, Bob, for you. Well, and he was well, asking about, green. you know, oh, he yeah. said, he mentioned that uh, pure uh, bent grass, uh, pure distinction, new build construction. They're about two years in and there's excessive ball marks, wear and tear. And he was wondering if there's a way to minimize ball mark showing, or is it simply a matter of firmness? How do you approach things like that? Well, I think he's saying about young, a young bent grass green, excessive ball marks, which is, has to mature the green. I mean, obviously we are, are, we as members have to have fix a ball mark and fix another ball mark, know how to fix the ball mark. So your membership doesn't, if it doesn't know how to fix a ball mark, it's wasted time. It's just going to be a dead ball mark. I used to get a lot of ball marks at Atlantic early on. And it was not because of the greens were not good. Nobody was fixing them properly. So one Saturday morning, I went out with irrigation flags and I flagged every ball mark that wasn't fixed from the day before. And the first group went out and had a putt through the irrigation flags and they all started screaming. I said, until you guys learn how to fix ball marks, you're going to see that all the time. So in saying what he's saying is, A, it's a two question. If it's a young green, you're going to have to take it in maturity. It has to get some organic matter. If the organic matter and the thatch is very low, it's just going to go right down to the soil and blow apart. So give the superintendent a little time, but also make sure that the membership knows how to fix a ball mark and make sure the membership takes care of their golf course. So if you walk out and you fix your ball mark, look for another one and know how to do it. Every club should have a lesson on how to fix a ball mark properly. Nobody should go out on that golf course when doing it wrong. I don't know if that helps them at all. Yeah, and I think with that, 
as a as a superintendent, is that something that you know, if, if you had one thing that you could have members do to to help maintain the golf course, would it be ball marks, or would you say is, is there anything else that, that really is your your bugaboo as superintendent? I think a ball marks number one because divots is under our control. Even if you don't replace all the divots, I we go out a lot and do our own divots, and the membership is pretty good with that. But ball marks are interesting for two reasons. One is with car traffic, especially last year with all car traffic, a guy hits in front of the green, gets a ball mark, takes his cart, goes around back and walks from the back of the green on. Never even goes look at it. So all of a sudden he's on the green. He doesn't even go and look at his ball mark. So I would have to say, and I work really hard as green chairman here on explaining to my, our members here how to fix a ball mark and how to look for a ball mark. Because there's all carts, there's no caddies here. And it's a wonderful golf course. But So I see a lot of that. And I always tell people, know where you hit your ball, walk up to your ball where it was, fix that. And then on the way to your ball back, look for another one. And I think we've reduced it a lot here by that. But I would have to say, superintendent can control a lot of things. But I can't control you fixing your ball marks every day. All I can do is try to educate you every day on doing it. And our pro shop here is very good. Um, trying to teach people. And if we get a new member here, which we're getting tons of new members, we try to take them out. And I try to play with every new member that's here and try to explain the importance of a ball mark and how to repair it. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from David Shannon about aeration. So he asked about uh, what exactly does aeration do? Why is it needed twice a year? And I had one follow up with that of my, you know, this is a question I get asked a lot from a lot of people who think I know everything because I'm an engineer. They think I know about <laughs> how golf courses work. But one of the, the things I've seen is our club recently switched from, you know, punching greens to slicing greens. And what's the difference to that? What's the, uh, how does that differently affect the grass? And, and why would you do one over the other? Well, it all depends. We get back to the soil test that I showed you. So for example, if, if you're at a golf course and I was, I was never a big aerifier, not that it's not good. I think aerification is huge if you have that kind of problem. At Garden City, I aerified once a year, but I kept the organic matter down, had a good root zone. I topped just when I had to, never made anything. Atlantic I did. But if I go into a golf course and I see that you're creeping up with, with your um, organic matter, I'll say right away, we got to go to two aerifications until we correct that problem and then we have to maintain it. So it's a combination, we talk about aerification. Aerification is a good way to correct a problem um, it's the best way to correct the problem. And then maybe if you're doing everything right and you feel comfortable, you can get down to one aerification. And then, you know, it's not so much compaction. It's about keeping that organic matter out of your green. Now I get to that slicing. Now I'm not, I think that works. The grading is great. All those machines, the grading is a great slicing machine. Any way you can reduce your organic matter or thatch in a green will improve that green. So it's a combination of aerification and thatching. It's a, whatever you feel more comfortable with. A superintendent, everybody knows their own golf course. They know how it responds. Um, some, I re, always aerated once a year and basically did nothing else. But there's a lot of guys that air fight twice a year and grade and do everything because they know their golf course. So you really have to have trust in your superintendent that he's going to try to do it for those reasons. So it gets back to soil testing. It gets back. Then you make a plan on what you should do. Okay, I'm a USGA green and I get no compaction and I can, I'm not top dressing. I'm top dressing frequently. I'm doing verticutting frequently. I'm doing everything right. Low nitrogen, not building anything up. And I can get away with one a year. And then maybe I have to go out with a quadro time, which is a great tool for superintendents during this season, just to pull a small little quarter inch plug, just to keep air going and fuss. So aerification, hence the word air, it gets air down in there. So there's multiple ways to do it. I would, I would always start when I go places, I always start with aerification. I don't care about anything else. And if I get you to a place that your greens are better and I know that, okay, maybe we can do a thatching or maybe we can do that. But air fire is the quickest way to get you to where we have to be. And then we have to be on a maintenance plan that works for that. How to, and every green and every situation is different. And then think about play. Some golf courses have, I had 8,000 rounds of play at Atlantic. At, uh, I'm at Southampton Golf Club where they air fight twice a year. They get 20,000 rounds of golf a year. More compaction, more need air to get back in there. So they have to do that just because of the amount of play. So there's a whole thing with soil test, amount of play, superintendent knowing his golf course, where he came from. Because we think about a superintendent, 
he does a very different things. He's doing different things. And he says, oh, shit, this really works for migraines. This airification has really improved them. But another guy might say, you know, I put that gradient on there, that thatcher, and I get more results out of that because the, he takes the soil test next year in his organic matter. So it's a combination of the superintendent knowing his golf course, the thatch you have, or the organic matter, I like to call it, and the amount of play you have. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Greg Turner. He mentions that, you know, he's heard Gil Hans, he thinks it was Gil Hans at least, mentioning that uh, if we slowed down greens to a nine, that greens could be a lot more interesting and fun. Greg said that he, he grew up playing courses where they were, you know, they were, they were slower. You could have a lot more contours in the greens, but now with a lot faster paces, there's been, uh, you know, you have to take away some contours to make it more playable to allow for more pin placements. Do you think that, you know, there's a chance that, you know, slower, more interesting greens make a, make a resurgence, or do you think the, you know, people are just in love with, with, with speed and it's, that's the direction that things are going to keep going? We will never get away from speed. We let the horse out of the barn. It's staying out there forever. Let me tell you, Tom Doak kind of did that. If you look at Tom Doak's Sabonic project, he went with very severe greens, having conversations with Pascucci about, uh, I built these greens for nine or 10. And Pascucci said, oh, sounds great. Until people were putting nine or 10. And they said, we want fast greens. So we architects have to figure out what, what the, that membership is going to ask for. Now, in saying that, I'm not saying nine feet is the thing, and I'm not saying 13 is good. I'm saying the golf course superintendent, along with his green committee, has to find the speed that works best for those greens that they have. So it's a combination. It's really a big thing. Like, as green chairman here, we figured out, because this um, this is a Tom Fazio golf course, but Mike Strance did this. It was this Mike Strance's final job for Tom Fazio after he did Wade Hampton. And he built some really good greens here. We know 10 and a half is our number. Over 11, they get ridiculous for a day-to-day -day membership. So we came out as a green committee, said to the superintendent, okay, let's put the greens to where we like them. And then bring the step meter in and say 10 and a half is the number. So we did that. At Atlantic, our greens were flatter. Reese Jones greens were flatter. And we went out with the golf pro, Rick Hartman. It was wonderful. And we realized 12 feet had to be the number. Garden City Golf Club. Their kind of you know angled when I was there, and we twelve that membership wanted twelve feet for that. So I got to tell you that you architects have to make the greens interesting somehow, but they also have to realize they're going to be eleven or twelve feet, and maybe ten and a half might be the number, but they have to anticipate that. But then you know, in saying that, um, and that's in the the world I'm in. Now I'm not saying that if I go to Bandon Dunes and I'm playing nine foot fescue greens, I don't love them. I think they're great, you know, but I think in the world of the private um, world that I came from, you're never gonna get away from green speed. I think the education that Tom Doak and Gil and these, and, and these younger architects um, are doing are great. You look at another quick example that I know of, Friar's Head, super beautiful greens, some of the best new greens ever built. They're 11, 11 every day, and they're fun to putt, but they're hard to putt. They're interesting. So I think it, 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 I, I think the speed is here, and I think you have to blend interesting somehow with that. And that's why Gil Hans and Tom Doak and Cora are just great architects because they seem to be doing that. I'm not saying Gil's not right, but I just don't think it's ever going to happen. Great. I think we have time for maybe one more. Don't tell question. Gil I said any of this. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got time for, for one more quick question. And I think we'll maybe go with, with one from, from Ken Wong asking, uh, how important is it to follow USGA standards and specifications regarding greens versus, you know, I mean, like you said, these, these haven't always been around, right? So it's, how important is it to follow that? Is it more important for certain areas versus other areas? And Well, are you saying to me their recommendations as far as turf goes? Right, yeah. Well. You're talking to the wrong guy because I'm not a big fan of the, you know, the USGA. USGA, they, in my opinion, they tend to um, change a lot their value over the years. Like they'll say, well, we should be doing four pounds of N a year. And, you know, they'll change. You know, the, the best, you know, you got some great, cons not me personally, but there's some great consultants out there that will tell you the exact opposite of what USGA goes in and says. Um, Steve McDonald, in my opinion, is one of the best consultants in the whole Northeast. Uh, 
he'll tell you anything. Everything the USJ might tell you, he goes, I'm going to tell you something different, but you got to believe in what I tell you because he's done it. I did it for 44 years. I'm not out there just saying things that I saw the university did. I'm telling you real life what I experienced. I made a lot of mistakes as a golf course superintendent or greenkeeper. And as I made mistakes, I kept fine tuning it. That's knowledge that the USGA can't have. They can give you basics and they can do that. But, you know, and maybe this is terrible to say, but that's just how I feel. Um, probably not a good thing to say though in the future. <laughs> no, I think, I think that, was, that was a great answer. And I think <laughs> maybe, maybe we have time for one more really quick one. Let me, uh, let me pull that up again quickly. Give me one second. And I think... We had one question from Charles Miller asking, is there a minimum or optimum number of pin placements on a green that you should have when building a new green? I believe, I really believe you need, how can I say this thing is, I, I like big greens. I like big angles. I like a lot of pin placements. I like a lot of variety. So if I'm building a green, not, you know, if I was an architect, which I'm not, but if I was, I would probably build nice, big, nice greens with nice movement in them, but big to take them and have a lot of pin placements. I hate going to greens that are 12 feet and with three pin placements, you're playing the same thing all the time. South Ham and let's get back to that green speed real quick. Southampton Golf Club, great Seth Rayner greens. We keep them at 10 feet and people complain all the time. You go down the block to West Hampton, who has great you know, Seth Rainer greens, they keep them almost 11 and a half and everybody loves them. But I like a lot of pin placements. I like greens that are very interesting, different plateaus, different angles. I don't know if there's a minimum, I would say, but if I had a variety of pin placements, more than three, as many as I could get, it just makes it better for the membership to play different ones. And you can, you can look at it right now. And this is a good question. You look at it right now, what is the one thing Gil Hans does right now when he goes into a golf course? He expands every green back to where they were by 30%. If you go to where he did at Marion, it's got to be 25 to 30%. You go to, um, you know, Wingfoot, the way he expanded, Wingfoot, I just was there on the east, fantastic undulating greens, rolling 12 feet, by the way, with great little plateaus of pin placements. So I think these architects can find the old pin placements, which were there. They, and they rebuild them. And then I think their new jobs are finding interesting pin placements. As we all know, you, a, a, a pin stuck in the back right of a challenging little par four is a lot of fun. And I think that's what they're creating right now. So I like as many as I can get. I like variety in pin placements. I don't mind if it's even like a little, you could call it a little unfair at times if it's not every hole like that. Great, thank you. I, I'd love to keep going, especially asking the superintendent what he thinks is unfair. But I think uh, we're we're running out of time here, so I just want to, you know, conclude the presentation for today. Huge thank you to you, Bob. That was that was really uh, interesting. Uh, thank you to all the uh, MIT alumni, golfers, and guests for your questions and your participation in this. For joining us, uh, your comments and suggestions are always welcome, both about today's program and any future topics you'd like to see. Uh, keep an eye out for some announcements coming in January about a couple new events we're doing in uh, late February and April. And finally, just uh, one, one plug to tell all your, uh, your golfing alumni friends about our group. We're always looking to expand our membership. Uh, this is one time where a crowded course is actually a good thing. Uh, and I, with that, I'd just like to thank you all again for joining and for you to all have a great day.